In this video, we're going to start talking about the economic metric called the price level. And we're going to begin with the idea of measuring price level changes. Now, the most common issue with the price level is when prices are going up, and that's called inflation. But understand that there are other types of price level changes that we'll consider later on, such as deflation and stagflation. In order to measure inflation, we need to go out and figure what are people buying. And there is an organization called the Bureau of Labor Statistics that every month compiles this data. And they do it by looking at the market basket of a typical household. So what does a typical household buy? Well, from their standpoint, they see the typical household buying these eight different categories here housing, food and beverages, recreation, medical care, transportation, etc. So they create these eight categories, and you'll notice each category has a different weight. So from the Bureau of Labor Statistics standpoint, they believe the typical household spends 41% of their budget on housing. They believe 17% is spent on transportation, so on and so forth. Once they have these categories, they then look at specific goods that are bought. So there's actually over 200 goods and services included in here. And you can imagine some. For example, under housing, you would have home insurance. You might also have the cost of paying a yard maintenance person, your uh, electric bill, your water bill. These are all related to housing. In addition, if we look at transportation, gasoline, car insurance, what about medical care? A specific good there could be regular checkups with your doctor or dentist. Now they have the eight categories that they believe represent the typical household and over 200 goods and services. They then visit over 23,000 stores across 87 cities in the U.S. to determine the cost of living index. Now, they've benchmarked this data to 1983. For our purposes, what that means is they created the basket in 1983 and they've left it the same ever since. There are nuances there, but for the most part, it's important to keep the basket consistent because what are we trying to measure here? Changes in the cost of living, inflation, we want to know if this basket here is getting more expensive over time, and if so, by how much compared to previous periods. So we need to keep the basket consistent so we can see inflation. Now, there is a subcategory of the Consumer Price Index. That's called the Core CPI. This is where the Bureau of Labor Statistics strips out any goods or services that are related to food and energy. And it's not a specific category, although there's going to be most of food and beverages removed. So this category is going to be pretty much eliminated. But some of these food and energy prices show up in multiple categories. For example, gasoline or natural gas. Uh, both of these utilities would show up in housing and transportation. But we would just strip out the specific good of utilities. The reason that they do this is because food and energy prices are very volatile. We're collecting this data on a monthly basis. So you could have a month where food and energy prices have soared, and that's going to make inflation look really high. But then the next month, maybe those same uh, food and energy prices collapse, and that's going to make inflation look really low. By stripping out food and energy, we strip out that volatility and we get a more consistent measurement month over month over month. Because food and energy prices don't have as dramatic a change when we look at year over year, we don't need to consider the core CPI when looking at annual data over a long period of time. But monthly data, the core CPI sometimes can provide a more stable understanding of what's happening to inflation. To understand how the Bureau of Labor Statistics calculates the Consumer Price Index, we're going to create a hypothetical uh, household 
that buys one category of goods instead of eight, that is just food, and they buy two goods instead of over 200, so 24 loaves of bread and 12 gallons of milk per month. Once we have our hypothetical, typical household, we can then do what the Bureau of Labor Statistics does with the broader uh, U.S. And there's going to be three steps involved in calculating a consumer price index. The first step is to calculate the expenditures for the market basket for each period. Notice down here we have three periods, January, February, March. We have the price of bread in each period, price of milk, and then what we're going to do is, knowing what the typical household buys, we're going to create the expenditures on that same basket each month. Let's go ahead and do this. So let's start with January. In January, bread was a dollar, and we buy 12 loaves of bread, so we're going to have $24 spent on bread. And then in January, we spend $2 on milk and 12 gallons of milk. So 2 times 12 is $24 on milk. We add that together, we get $48. So that's our expenditures, I'll put 48 here. Now in February, it looks like bread has went up. So in February, we're going to spend $1.15 to buy those 24 loaves of bread. So if I take 24 times 1.15, I get $27.60. And then for milk, it looks like I'm spending 210 and I'm buying uh, 12 gallons. So if I take 12 gallons times 210, I get 25.20. And then I add those two together and get 52.80. And then for March, let me write this here, 52.80. And then for March, we're paying $1.40 for bread, still buying the same 21 loaves. So 24 times 140, 33.60 for loaves of bread, and then milk, we're paying 220, so 220 times 12 uh, gallons of milk, and I get 2640. And if I add those together, I get $60. 60. Okay, notice that for each of these periods, January, February, and March, the basket did not change. Yet, I went from spending $48 to $52.80 to $60. This increase in expenditures, given the fixed basket, is inflation. Higher prices. The next step is to establish the base period. This is just a benchmark for comparing uh, our price level across time. And it'll make more sense when we wrap this process up. But when you establish a base period, it doesn't really matter what period you choose. So we have three periods here, January, February, March. We could choose any of them. Let's go ahead and go with January. Uh, that's actually the reason January is a slightly different color. Uh, but again, it won't matter for calculating inflation rates uh, when we get to that point. Step three is to calculate the index for each period using this formula. Okay, so this is going to actually create the consumer price index and wrap up the process. To do this, we just plug in the numbers. So let's start out with uh, January. Well, the expenditures in the current period in January would be $48. And the expenditures in the base period, which we just said is January, would be $48. Well, 48 over 48 is 1 times 100. That means our CPI in the base period is 100. That's always going to be the case. So that is why the benchmark is always 100 in the base period. Now, recall that 
for the actual consumer price index, 1983 is the base year. Therefore, if you look at the data, you'll find that the consumer price index in 1983 is 100. When we go to February, though, to create that index, we're going to see that the numerator changes here. For February, the numerator is going to be 5280. Write that here, 52.80. But we're going to be dividing by that base period expenditure, which is 48 and then we're going to multiply by 100. If you do that, 52.8 divided by 48 is equal to 1.1 times 100 is 110. So that gives us a February index of 110. Then we do the same thing for March. In March, we take the expenditures in the current period, March, which is 60, and we divide that by the base period, expenditures 48, multiply by 100, 60 divided by 48 times 100 is 125. 125. So you can see inflation in two ways. You can see inflation by looking at the increased expenditures in the market basket, but you can also see it now because the index is going up. The index we're going to find is actually easier to read. For example, if you know that expenditures go from 48 to 52.80 between January and February, you know there's inflation, but it's hard to know what that percentage change is. But if you look at the index, the index went from 100 to 110. Very easy to recognize that that's a 10% increase in prices. If you go from uh, January to March, the expenditures went from 48 to 60. Well, that's not easy to do the math in your head and figure out what percentage change that is. But the index went from 100 to 125, so that's a 25% increase. And it makes it easier when using an index. So we've now completed the three steps. We've done exactly what the Bureau of Labor Statistics does when they create the consumer price index. Now let's talk about some issues with the consumer price index. There's several of them. The first is called the substitution bias. This is a problem that emerges because the market basket we use is generally fixed. It needs to be. We're trying to measure changes in the cost of the basket, the expenditures on the basket, so we can't change the uh, actual quantity of items in the basket and get an accurate measurement of inflation. But that does create an issue because if the basket that they're using to represent households is fixed, but households are actually making substitutions, then we might get an indicator, a measurement of inflation that differs from what households are actually feeling. Example, if in the basket we have apples and oranges and the price of apples goes up, well, that's going to show up as inflation, assuming oranges stay the same. But what people do in their own household baskets is when the price of apples goes up, they buy less apples and more oranges. We substitute away from a more expensive good, apples, towards a cheaper one. And that actually makes the um, inflation that we feel a little less than what might be revealed in the consumer price index. So that's a substitution bias. Another bias is the outlet bias. This is kind of similar, but instead of looking at substituting apples for oranges, we're substituting where we do the shopping. So, for example, if uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, if they're going to Vons and believe that you're buying your groceries there and the price of groceries at Vons are going up, they're seeing that as inflation. They're registering that as inflation. But what households often do is they substitute outlets. You might start going to grocery outlet, or you might go to Dollar Tree, or a more inexpensive venue to get those goods. So the inflation that you feel in your household may not be as extreme as what is reflected, because the Bureau of Labor Statistics believes you're still shopping at bonds. Uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, they do use various survey methods to determine uh, where people are shopping, but the ability of households to change their baskets and where they shop is much more rapid than what the Bureau of Labor Statistics can keep up on.